Now, on to the elephant in the room, which is the passage you just heard. The end is coming. And we know that the end is coming, but which end is coming is maybe a good question to begin with. The Bible is not the only voice that is telling us that the end is coming. Scholars and pundits and politicians from many different fields, they all have theories about how and when the end is going to come. Astrophysicists tell us that in about five billion years, the sun is going to run out of its hydrogen and it will swell so large as it begins consuming helium then that it will encompass the entire orbit of Mercury and Venus and maybe the Earth. Uh, Nothing of human civilization will survive. That is, if we have not already by this time been finished off by a gamma ray burst or a comet or an asteroid. If the sun gets to this point, even Bruce Willis isn't going to save us. (laughs) Medically, we could be finished off even far before then as the flaws in our DNA become so pervasive that we simply cannot reproduce anymore. Or we could be wiped out by a deadly pathogen. This is not so far-fetched. It was only a hundred years ago this year that the Spanish flu inflicted, sorry, infected an entire third of the population on Earth. And three to five percent of all human beings on Earth died. Statistically speaking, it is not inconceivable. It is not beyond the realm of possibility that a pathogen could uh, could spread that no human being can, can fight. Scary thing is that we actually have the technology to develop such a pathogen ourselves, um, which isn't to say that, you know, it doesn't already exist in some government lab somewhere. The question is, how stupid are we? Um, you know, the, the, when it comes to the end coming, I think most people recognize that, you know, five billion years is a long time, and more than likely, um, if the end's going to come, it's going to be something we've done to ourselves. We seem to be reminded a lot in the news lately uh, by Mr. Putin, Mr. Trump, and Mr. Kim that we are only ever 25 minutes from complete and utter nuclear annihilation. And then there's the environment. Not a day goes by that we are not reminded that our consumerist lifestyles come at a cost of significant harm to the air and the land and the water that we depend on for our survival. It might be climate change or it might be some molecule that we make in order to have more awesome water bottles that suddenly ends up, you know, sterilizing the entire human race before we, you know, realize that we've done that. Um, There are so many different ways that things can can go wrong for us, hey? We, as as human beings, get so excited about thinking about the possibilities of what we can do, and we don't really spend a lot of time thinking about what we should do. You know, when I was a kid, um, the concept of the rise of the machines was the stuff that was in Schwarzenegger movies. Um, These days, it seems to be Silicon Valley Silicon Valley's uh, plan for revenue development. And I think as a species, we are beginning to understand that we're in trouble. The end is going to come, and it's because we've brought it on. The sad thing is that we don't realize that beyond our relationship with one another, beyond our relationship with the planet we live on, we as a species have a major problem because of the relationship we have with the God that created us. See, behind all the pain, all the suffering, all the injustice in the world, all of our destructive tendencies is the reality that we have rejected our Creator. We live in bodies that He made for His glory, but we use them for evil and destructive purposes. We abuse our bodies. 
We have minds that he created to know him and to love him and to worship him and to serve alongside him in in stewarding all of creation. But what do we use our minds for? We puff ourselves up with pride. And instead of giving our minds to God, we give our minds to idols. The creator sent his son into the world so that we could be invited back into the family of God, so that the way could be opened for us. But the world continues to reject him. And in rejecting the Prince of Peace, we reject peace outright. We destroy each other. We destroy the world we depend on. And we're naive enough to think that we're getting better. That's why people use this word progress. It's this idea that we're getting better, completely contrary to the evidence. And you know what? This can't go on forever. This broken relationship between us and our Creator, it cannot go on forever. Something has to be done. I want to read to you um, a story that Jesus told. Now, in the latter part of his ministry, Jesus was in Jerusalem and he was at the temple. He had cleansed the temple. He kicked out the money changers and the people who were buying and selling in there. And he, bega- and he began to teach. And the scribes and the Pharisees, they challenge him and they say, what authority are you saying all these things with? Like, who are you to tell us what to do? And so he tells them this story. And he says, and, and you can look this up in Matthew chapter 1. It's in three of the Gospels, but look it up in Matthew. He says, A certain landowner planted a vineyard. He built a wall around it and dug a pit for pressing out the grape juice. And he built a lookout tower. And then he leased the vineyard to tenant farmers and moved to another country. At the time of the grape harvest, he sent his servants to collect his share of the crop. But his farmers grabbed his servants, and they beat one, killed one, and stoned another. So the landowner sent a larger group of his servants to collect for him, but the results were the same. Finally, the owner sent his son, thinking, surely they will respect my son. But when the tenant farmers saw his son coming, They said to one another, here comes the heir to this estate. Come on, let's kill him and get the estate for ourselves. And so they grabbed him, they dragged him out of the vineyard, and they murdered him. And Jesus says to the scribes and Pharisees, he says, when the owner of the vineyard returns, what do you think he will do with those farmers? What do you think the consequences of rejecting the Creator, rejecting His messengers, rejecting His Son over and over and over again should be? You know what? For God to be patient and send warnings, it demonstrates that this is a God of love, this is a God of mercy. He waits. And we are in this time of waiting. This time of opportunity for people to turn their hearts back to God. But there has to come a time when the end will come. In order for God to be a good God, for Him to be a just God, evil cannot continue to rule over this this world forever. It has to come to an end at some point. A day of reckoning has to come. The end has to come. Now, I realize that then raises, you know, a a logical next question of when. When will the end finally come? And you know what? I don't know. I do know that I'm not supposed to know, though. Jesus says in this very passage that Doug read in, in Revelation 16, he says, Look, I will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Blessed are all who are watching for me who keep their clothing ready so they will not have to walk around naked and ashamed. You know what? If it was Jesus' intention to provide us with a, a concrete end date, he could have very well done so. He could have very well communicated when the end would come, but he actually had good reason not to. 
See, his intention is that the people who belong to him, the people who are part of his church in every age, from the time of his ascension into heaven till the time of his return, will be awake. That we will not have drifted off into distraction or complacency or losing sight of the mission that he has called us to, to continually calling people to return to him. We need to know that the end can come at any time. We need to not be distracted and living as if we can go off and live as as pagans, you know, thinking like, okay, I know Jesus is coming back on, you know, September 23rd, so I'm, you know what, I'm good till then, and then September 22nd, I'll really just make sure I'm ready then. No, be ready now is the message. The focus has to be on the imminence of his coming so that we know that this world is not our home. We need to be looking forward to the world to come. So rather than giving us a timeline uh, or even a, an end date, what we see here in Scripture is that these, these judgments that, that happen happen in a pattern of escalating warnings. And, and they're, they're presented from different perspectives. And this is called recapitulation, and here's how it works. We're given three different sets of judgments in this book, right? So back in, in, in chapter, in the, in the first part of the book, we get seven seals. Jesus, the only one who is worthy to judge, begins opening these seven seals. But then in chapter 11, we get... Um, Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So uh, first we get the seven, seven seals, then we get seven trumpets, and then in this chapter we get seven bowls. Back in chapter 6, we read about Jesus opening seven seals on a scroll. And as he opens them, the forces of conquest and war and famine and death are released. And death takes a quarter of the population of people and animals. Remember that number, one quarter, because it's important. By the time you look, reach the sixth of those seven seals, it looks like we've come to the end, like this is it, it's all over. In chapter 6, John writes, I watched as the Lamb broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun became as dark as black cloth, and the moon became as red as blood. Then the stars of the sky fell to earth like green figs falling from a tree shaken by a strong wind. The sky was rolled up like a scroll. And all the mountains and islands were moved from their places. Then everyone, the kings of the earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy, the powerful, every slave and free person all hid themselves in caves and among rocks and mountains. And they cried to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of wrath has come. And who is able to survive? We read this and we think, okay, this is it. This is the end. But when the Lamb opens the seventh seal, it's it's like you get this half-hour period of silence and then the cycle starts over again. We read that seven angels are given seven trumpets and as they blow these trumpets, the same kinds of things begin to happen. The first trumpet, we see a fire that destroys a third of the earth. Remember that fraction, because with the seven seals, we had a quarter. Now it's reached a third. The second trumpet is a third of the sea that turns to blood and everything dies in that third, and a third of the ships are destroyed. The third trumpet, the star, a star falls from the sky and makes a third of the drinking water toxic. Now, by the time, I'm not going to go through all of them, by the time you get to the seventh trumpet... We've arrived at Judgment Day, and the people who have brought destruction on the earth are going to be judged. Now, when we get to the seven bowls in chapter 15 and 16, we see many of the same kinds of things, and it's almost as if we started over again, except this time there are no more pauses and there are no more fractions. We've reached totality. The time has come for the beast's kingdom to end. And so you, like, 
you read this and you're like, okay, how does this all fit together? Now, some people have taken the whole book to be a, a linear timeline, right? But there's, there's a challenge with that. You know, how many times can the sky dark, go dark? How many times can the mountains be flattened? Um, as I said before, this, this is a, a unique piece of writing called apocalyptic literature. And these, these visions are, are showing us the same thing from, from different perspectives in different time frames. You know, I was trying to think, you know, like, this kind of writing doesn't exist anymore. Um, then it occurred to me that there's actually a movie that was made using a very similar structure, uh, the movie Dunkirk, which came out last, last year. Now, Dunkirk is, is history, so I will accept no flack for spoilers here, okay? It's your job to know history. So, you know, I'm... It's a film reference. Deal with it. Okay? So, um, <clears throat> in the telling the story of the evacuation of Dunkirk in World War II, the filmmaker Christopher Nolan actually brings together three different stories that are actually the same story. And, and they're told in different time frames. And so, the story of the infantrymen on the breakwater, which, which is referred to in the movie as the mole, it spans one week. Okay? The story of the men on the little ship... Uh, on the sea, it spans one day, and then the third part of the story is uh, the story of the, the Spitfire pilot, and that story spans one hour. But they're all coming together into one final scene, and so um, that's very similar to what we see going on here between the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls. They're all building toward the end. But the, the, the point of this is not to give us an end date. The point of this is for us to recognize that the end is coming. And as the end comes, things do get worse. It will escalate. The conflict between the beast and between the kingdom of God will escalate until it finally reaches a head. But this doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. When the world is falling apart, doesn't mean that God some, somehow abdicated his responsibilities. doesn't mean that there is no God. It means that the end is coming. The first part of a renovation is always to remove the, the old part that you don't want so that the new can come in. A new heaven, a new earth are coming. And the old has to be dealt with first. The third set of questions I want to look at is what is going on and why? So how is this all going to play out? What do, what do these seven different bold judgments uh, mean? Now, you know what? I don't think it's actually helpful at this point for me to try and, and you know, identify specific real-world correlations um, you know, that, that might happen in the news to a specific judgment. Um, that's a very well-trodden road of people who have been wrong. Um, if you study history and read historical theology, um, you'll understand why. Um, but I do want to make some observations about these plagues. Specifically, what is being communicated in each of them? What, do, what is it that we're meant to see? Because you know what? These plagues, as puzzling as they might be to our eyes, they, they, they're not given haphazardly. This is not God throwing a temper tantrum and being sadistic. I think... If, if we know nothing of the world in which this book was written, if we know nothing of biblical history, we might come to that conclusion. But if we, if we understand the, frame of, uh, uh, the framework that John would understand these, these visions with, we'd see that, no, this is all very intentional. This is a very measured and methodical dismantling of evil's grip on the world. We need to see that. This is intentional. Let's look at the first one. The first, the first uh, is the malignant sores. Verse 2 says, So the angel left the temple and poured out his bowl on the earth, and horrible malignant sores broke out on everyone who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his statue. Now, it's hard for us to say with certainty what the mark of the beast is other than that it is, an, it is a sign of allegiance. It's an allegiance that is not to Christ. It is to a false God. 
someone who is not worthy of our allegiance. And people have, in, in Revelation, people have accepted this mark of allegiance to the beast so that they can buy and sell, so that life can continue, so that it can go on as normal. But in eternity, this can't go on. In eternity, allegiance to the beast, allegiance to anyone other than the God who created the universe leads to death. And so this, this marring disease of sores is a very tangible warning that following the beast does not lead to life as normal indefinitely. Following the beast leads to death. For God to inflict this on people is not a sign of capriciousness. It's a sign of mercy. You know, this plague and and many of the the plagues we're going to see following, they've happened before. God sent a lot of these same plagues on the Egyptians in order to break their ability to hold God's people in slavery, to, to, to convince Pharaoh to let God's people go, all the gods of Egypt and all their different spheres of influence had to be shown as completely powerless. And so you have a god of health, for example, that a plague is sent to break the Egyptians' confidence in. No, your, your false God cannot save you. Get the message. And you know what? Some of them did. Egyptians, sorry, Exodus 12 tells us that some of the Egyptians themselves chose to leave with God's people when they left Egypt. Some of the Egyptians themselves saw that the gods they had followed were powerless that there was no hope in them. Some of them saw that Pharaoh was no God and he had no power compared to the Lord. Some of them saw that their only hope, their only hope was Yahweh. And the intention here in Revelation 16 is that even at this late stage of history, the followers of the beast would repent. Yeah, we, we know from our experience and we know from Scripture that Some people, most people maybe, respond to judgment by just cursing God. That happens. But some come to see that the beast offers no hope and no future. Their only refuge for their souls is Jesus. Second plague, water into blood. Actually, this is the second and third plague. Verses 3 and 4 say, The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and everything in the sea died. And then a third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs, and they became blood. This is also from from the the plagues of Egypt. But here, uh, an angel actually speaks up and tells us why this particular plague is appropriate. And this is what the angel says. You are just, O Holy One, who was and who always was. Sorry, who is and who always was, because you have sent these judgments. Since they shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets, you have given them blood to drink, and it is their just reward. And I heard a voice from the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God the Almighty, your judgments are true and just. You know, in the next chapter, we're going to read about Babylon the Great, who is described as... uh, Babylon the Great is a city, but described as a a prostitute who has gorged herself on the blood of the saints. That's talking about persecution. Just like that parable Jesus told about the the tenant farmers, Jesus, or the, the Lord has sent prophets and he sent evangelists, he sent apostles, he sent witnesses into the world to constantly call people back to come back to him. The way is open. It costs you nothing. Come back to Jesus. Come back to God. Repent of your sin and embrace the life I've given you. What does the world do with these witnesses? The world kills them. So the consequence of spilling the blood of God's people 
is that those who have followed the beast are said to give, be given blood to drink. Now, what does this fulfillment look like in, in practical terms? I'm not even going to speculate. But we should know that this judgment is a measured and deliberate response to the bloodthirsty rejection of God's witnesses. Third, the scorching sun. Verse 8, Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, causing it to scorch everyone with its fire. Everyone was burned by this blast of heat, and they cursed the name of God who have control, who had control over all these plagues. They did not repent of their sins, and they turn, and turned to God and give him glory. You know what this shows us? This shows us that people don't just follow the beast uh, by accident. Uh, people don't just um, stumble into evil. Just as people show their allegiance to Christ by suffering for Jesus, people who love evil are willing to suffer to continue in their allegiance to evil. That's why even when they're being punished by God, they refuse to repent. They know exactly where this judgment is coming from. They know why it's happening. But their hearts, their their allegiance belongs to evil. Fourth, darkness. When the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, sorry, then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. His subjects ground their teeth in anguish and they cursed the God of heaven for their pain and their sores. But they did not repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. See, with this plague, the God takes on the kingdom of the beast head on. Not to destroy the beast yet, or him, those who follow him just yet, but to demonstrate that the beast's power is broken. He did the same with Pharaoh in Egypt. If the beast can't even keep the lights on, right? It must mean that he is answerable to someone who can We're being shown here that the kingdom which rejects the light will one day be denied the light. See, everything that that the kingdom of evil does happens in a world that God has made and God sustains. And the day will come when he, when he simply refuses to provide them with that platform. Fifth, Armageddon. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great Euphrates River, and it dried up so that the kings of the east could march their armies toward the west without hindrance. And they saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs from the mouths of the, from the, mouths of the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. They are demonic spirits who work miracles and go out to all the rulers of the world and gather them for battle against the Lord on that great judgment day of God the Almighty. And the demonic spirits gathered all the rulers and their armies to a place with the Hebrew name Armageddon. So here we see the kingdom of evil participating in its own undoing. Evil spirits think that they can gather and deceive all the people of the world so that they will come together for one final push against God. They're going to wipe the Lord and his influence and his people from the earth once and for all. What they don't know is that they are gathering for their defeat. See, 650 years before this book was written, the city of Babylon was the dominant superpower. And it had walls, and, and those walls could not be breached by an invading army. When, when they closed their gates, there was no way in or out of the city. They thought, They're invulnerable. But when the Persian prince, Cyrus the Great, diverted the river Euphrates that flowed through that city, left a gaping wide hole for him to march his armies in. See, the message here is that the kingdom of darkness is so hopelessly weak, but they are so hopelessly ignorant about it. They don't even know. 
Now, before this last battle happens, the seventh angel pours out one more plague. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a mighty shout came from the throne in the temple, saying, It is finished. Then the thunder crashed and rolled, and the lightning flashed, and a great earthquake struck, the worst since people were placed on the earth. The great city of Babylon split into three sections and the cities of many nations fell into heaps of rubble. So God remembered all of Babylon's sins and he made her drink the cup that was filled with the wine of his fierce wrath and every island disappeared and the mountains were leveled. There was a terrible hailstorm and hailstones weighing as much as 75 pounds fell from the sky onto people below. And they cursed God because of the terrible plague of the hailstorm. See, here we come to the end where God's wrath is complete with this natural disaster, natural disasters, such as the world has never seen. The world is turning on the parasites that have invaded it. In the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul wrote that the creation waits with eager longing to be set free from slavery to decay. And here in the final stages of history, creation itself is being used to break the hold of evil over the world. The cup of God's wrath is being poured out in full measure. Now, at this point, you might be thinking that this, this just seems horribly unfair. That God is not good and not just for doing this. And if people had no choice in the matter, if they just kind of stumbled into this completely ignorant of, of who God is or what they were made for, yeah, it would be unfair. But every escalating stage of judgment, every encounter that we have with pain and suffering in this world is a reminder that we were made for better things. We were made to be at peace with the creator of the world and his presence is the only real home that we can ever have. We're meant to be reminded of that. Every instance of evil and injustice in this world is meant to plead with us to recognize that our idols are powerless that our self-sufficiency counts for nothing. There is only one who has the right and the ability to lead us. And that is God alone. Yeah, we are all guilty of sin. We've all turned our backs on God. And this finish, all these things that happen when that final cry goes out, it is finished, we deserve it all. Every one of us. I deserve it. But the it is finished of Revelation 16 doesn't have to be for us. Because Jesus' flesh was torn by whips so that we could be healed. His hands and feet were pierced for our transgressions. When Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, and the sky turned black and the city was rocked by an earthquake, he drank the cup of God's wrath so that our sins would be remembered no more. And with that, the wrath of God against our sin is truly done. See, the God who judges the world, the one who is worthy to open the scrolls, to unleash all this, this is the God who loved the world so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus, who comes in Revelation as a judge, came in the Gospels as a suffering servant so that none of this has to happen to us.
you believe that Jesus died for you and rose from the dead, if you confess that he is Lord, that he has the right to rule, you will be saved. This is the message that we desperately need to understand and need to tell the world. The end will come, but it doesn't have to be bad. Let's pray. I'm going to pray, and, and if, if you are ready to tell Jesus that you accept what he did for you, I'm going to invite you just in your minds to repeat and and agree with what I'm saying. Jesus, you are the creator of this world and and you are the creator of, of me. You made me to know you and to love you. I confess that I have turned away. I have given my allegiance and my worship to to idols. I have believed that I could do it on my own. And I have rejected you as my Lord. But I believe that you went to the cross to pay the penalty that I deserved so that my sins would be remembered no more. Thank you. Thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you, Jesus. I am yours. My life, my allegiance, my worship, my eternity are with you. In Jesus' name, amen.